look at this thing called Euler's formula. It's a really beautiful mathematical formula uh, in that it, it links things together. Now, in order to do this, I want to introduce this idea. We've got this thing called a McLaren series. And what it basically does is it writes a function, but rewrites it as a sum, some sort of series, an infinite sum. You see, all of our functions can actually be written as polynomials, and this is why polynomials are so important. The exponential function can actually be written like this. 1 plus x plus x squared on 2 factorial plus x cubed on 3 factorial plus x to the power of 4 on 4 factorial plus x to the power of 5 on 5 factorial and so on. If you keep going to infinity, that in fact would be e to the power of x. Graphically, here's two graphs. Now the black one, of course, is y e to the x. Now this blue one is that series, but I've only done those first few terms. Now the more terms you add onto this, the closer and closer that blue curve would wrap around e to the x and it would start transforming into it. The series doesn't actually need a lot of terms for it to become very good around zero. And you can see around zero and going, well, in the positive certainly towards one there, it's really tight to the curve. And that's only with a few terms. When you think about it, we're talking about an infinite number of terms. And we've only used a handful of terms there and it's already pretty close in between there. So that's our exponential curve. Now the cosine curve can also be written like a polynomial, but this is how the pattern goes with the cosine curve. You can see it alternates plus minus plus minus plus minus, and it's the even powers for this one. So 1 minus x squared on 2 factorial plus x to the 4 on 4 factorial and so on. If we look at that graph, there's our cosine curve, and look around the origin on this one. That again is just with the first few terms. But between, well gosh, it's even past minus one and one on this one, isn't it? It's already wrapping really nicely around the cosine curve. And as you add terms, that blue curve again would start wrapping into the cosine curve. The sine one then is all the odd powers. Again, it alternates plus minus plus minus, but it's all the odd powers. And that's why in the general formula you see the power is 2n plus 1 to ensure you get an odd number. There you go, x minus x cubed on 3 factorial plus x5 on 5 factorial minus x to the 7 on 7 factorial and so on. What is that? All of our functions can be written as a polynomial. And here, let's have a look at the sine curve. Again, in between, wow, that one's even getting closer to about 2 and minus 2. It's wrapped quite nicely with just a, a handful of terms. Now what that now allows us to do, and this is the beauty of Euler's formula, what it does, is it can now convert between exponentials and trig functions. And we do it via that polynomial. We can actually turn an exponential into a trig function. If we let x equal theta, so theta is going to be the angle basically in our trig function, then we know cos theta will be, we said it was the even ones, alternating plus minus plus minus, and sine will be the odd ones. Now, I'm going to substitute in i times theta into the exponential. If we substitute i theta into the formula, what this will now do will create that alternating pattern like we saw in the trig functions, because when we square the i, you're going to get negative 1, and so on. So it will become 1 plus i theta minus theta squared on 2 factorial minus i theta cubed on 3 factorial and so on and so on. If I break that up into real and imaginary parts, look what happens. In the real part, we have, and there's the pattern we saw for the cosine function, the even powers alternating, and the imaginary times, and there's the pattern we saw for the sine function, the odd powers alternating. And so it turns out to be cos theta plus i sine theta, which is form of a complex number. So that's how we can convert from an exponential into trig. e to the iota theta is actually the same as cos theta plus i sine theta. And that's Euler's formula. Some people say one of the most beautiful formulas in all mathematics because it ties everything together nicely. I say, we don't need to know how we got there. I just wanted to show you that. So it's not, I'm not, not just plucking it out of thin air. There is something behind it that works. What this now means is we've got yet another way of expressing complex numbers. We first of all saw just x plus iy, which we said, well, okay, that's 
using our Cartesian form, our x and our y coordinates. We then moved on to what we called mod arg form. It actually has another name. It's called polar form. When we write it in terms of its length and the angle, we, we call that polar form. But we often call it mod arg form when we're talking about complex numbers. But now we have this third way. And all I've done to this formula is multiplied it by the length of the, the vector or the modulus, if you like. And that's what we call exponential form. This is the same complex number we looked at when we first looked at mod arg form, when we first looked at Cartesian form. Let's now put it in exponential form and see what it looks like. We already have seen that the modulus is 4 root 2 and the argument is minus pi and 4. And so it would simply look like that. 4 root 2, the modulus, times e to the power of the argument times i. So minus i pi on 4. And there it is in exponential form. So now we can use exponentials to do multiplication and division. Here's my two complex numbers, root 3 plus i and 1 minus root 3i. What would z times w be? Well, if I move it into exponential form, root 3 plus i, its modulus is 2, its argument is pi on 6, and 1 minus root 3i, modulus is also 2, uh, but its argument is minus pi on 3. We're just multiplying two exponentials together. This also explains why when we're multiplying, yes, we multiply the modulus, but we add the arguments. Because what we're really doing is playing with index laws. And when we multiply, we add the powers, and that's where it comes from. And if I want to find the number, I'll put it back in the mod arg form, because it's probably easier to work out the number there. And that would be 2 root 3 minus 2i. Z divided by w, similar thing now, I'm just using index laws, 2 divided by 2 is 1, and I would subtract the powers, when we divide we subtract the powers, uh, i pi on 2, hang on, pi on 2, so I know that one is simply i, the argument of pi on 2 must be purely imaginary, and its modulus is 1, so it's i. If I had to do z to the power of 5, well then it's going to be 2 to the power of 5, but it'll be 5 lots of i pi on 6. Again, highlighting that rule we had about when we're playing with modulus and argument, we would multiply the argument by the power. And again, if I wanted to work it out, you'll notice I didn't actually write down the mod arg form. Because in this, I already can see what the modulus and the argument is. So I can look at it and go, oh, 5 pi on 6. Well, the first one's going to be the cosine of 5 pi on 6 and the second one's going to be the sine of 5 pi and 6. I don't actually need to write down the cos and the i sine. Last year's HSC presented with this one. They told us z was e to the iota theta, so the modulus is 1 for this one. We had to show that z squared minus 1 on z squared plus 1 is purely imaginary. There is no real part to this. Well, let's substitute it, and I get e to the 2 iota theta minus 1 on e to the 2 iota theta plus 1. How on earth am I going to show this is purely imaginary? What I've done is I've divided everything by e to the iota theta. Now why did I do that? Well, think about what the powers are representing. The powers are representing the argument of the complex number. And now have a look at these powers. Iota theta and minus iota theta. One is the negative of the other. They're conjugates. And I know that when I subtract a number in its conjugate, I'll get twice the imaginary part. And when I add a number in its conjugate, I'll get twice the real part. So I've got 2i sine theta on 2 cos theta, which is i tan theta. Well, tan theta is just a number. So I have got something which is purely imaginary. I've got a multiple of i. So that's an introduction to this thing we call Euler's formula.